Hello everyone, it's Tuesday, October 8th. You're here at the weekly community call for chaos. I'm Elizabeth, community manager. I'm fighting a little bit of a cold, so I might cough through this, but I have a mute button, so we'll be all right. It'll, it'll work out. I'm gonna share this agenda. This is part of the chaos code of conduct. If you have not read that, then you should do so. Um, because being here, you kind of are agreeing not kind of arguing, you are agreeing to participate uh, based on that code of conduct. So we appreciate your compliance with that. Um, if you want to add your name here and tell us what kind of pie you like the best, that would be cool. I'm a huge fan of pumpkin pie and it's that time of year. So my little heart is happy. Apple is also good. I don't know that I've ever tried apple cranberry. Sophia, is that, is that a little bit of tartness to it? Seems like it would. Sounds yummy. I, I suppose you could also put some kind of meat pie as well if you like. Savory versus sweet. That's also valid. Oh yes, tart. Sorry, lost her. <laughs> I do that all the time, so yeah, I lose my windows all the time. Um, yeah. So I let's go like ahead and do bar. Oh, you know what? I have never in my life had rhubarb pie. I don't know why. I just haven't. That's tart also, right? Uh, I don't know what you mean with tart. Like, uh, what does that mean? Like, not sour, but like, sh like has a sharpness to it. So not like super sweet, overly sugary sweet, yeah. but just kind of has a little weight to it. Yeah. Yeah, it's an acquired taste. Not everyone will like it. <laughs> we had a rhubarb plant in our backyard growing up. And now that I moved to, uh, to the United States, my, well, grandparents-in-law, they have a rhubarb plant. So we can go and make rhubarb from our own plant. It's delicious. Is that something you have to, um, like, can you just eat it raw or is that, no, you have to cook it? Yeah, I've not tried eating it raw, but cooking it. Okay. You can. Right. I've, I've actually done it because we used to grow rhubarb too. And it's, oh. it's just super, it's super sour and you just sort of chew on it because it's really fibrous if it hasn't been cooked. Um, and it just makes your whole mouth pucker up. So as, as a kid, I used to, I used to like it. Just, I don't know. I think just for the extra sensation. It's better than warheads, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Would you say it's more sour than lemons then? Or about the same? Or just different? Different. Maybe a little less sour than lemons. Interesting. I can't believe I've never had it in my life. Like, what am I even doing with my life? I don't know. I'm going to have to try that. I have to go buy some rhubarb. <laughs> Yeah, it's on the bucket list for sure. Okay, let's jump in. Um, Matt and I put this on here just as a discussion and he's not able to make it today so we can even um, divert this till next week. But, you know, as we're kind of going through these metrics reviews with Peculiar and Yiga, um, we're looking at some of these visualizations from our older metrics and realizing that a lot of them get outdated quite quickly. Um, you know, once we, some of these are, the visualizations are like five, six years old. So I don't know how helpful they are, how accurate they are. Some of them, we have no idea how to determine the source because it like kind of got lost in translation somewhere along the line. Um, and some of them aren't maybe super helpful. Like this one was one, like that's not that helpful and insightful. Like obviously you can tell it's total contributor. So, um, we're just kind of wondering, we thought we'd bring it here. Can, can we take them out? We're just going to put that question out there. Can, is this something we can just take out? I, I would say no. My, oh, Georg's saying yes. Okay, we can fight about it. Um, <laughs> Go for it, Don. What's your rationale? What's your reason? Uh, so my rationale is that, um, so first of all, we should get we should remove the stuff that we don't know the source of and replace it with a visualization that we do know the source of. So I, I agree we have some visualizations that are not particularly useful. Um, personally, I don't think it's a big deal if they're outdated because I think a lot of people without the visualization have a hard time 
really just kind of picturing what this means, what what this what this data could look like, um, how it might be how it might be visualized. And so I think the visualizations are are super helpful in understanding the metric when they're done well. I think we need to do a better job of picking the right visualizations. But I think that when they're when they're there and when they're good, um, I think that they do a really nice job of of just sort of explaining how the metric how the metric can be used in an useful way. I also um, find them particularly useful when I'm writing guides and and other things because. There are visualizations for software that I don't immediately have access to. Um, like, you know, I don't have a Grimoire Lab instance handy. And some of the some of the visualizations from Grimoire Lab are really, really interesting. Um, and so sometimes I will just pull an old visualization from a metric to show in, in some of the practitioner guides. Because it doesn't, it doesn't matter if the if the data is out of date. It's just an ex an example of, of how you can how you can use the data. That's my two cents. So the the challenge I have with the visualizations and why I was okay with thing, I agree with you. It's it's good for someone uh, coming to a metric to get a sense for what are we talking about, and a picture or a diagram speaks more than a thousand words. It's much easier to to visualize that. The metrics we have, though, there there are different filters. There are different kinds of visualizing it: line chart, bar chart, pie chart, uh, heat map. There are many different ways to visualize it, and I like how in the in the guides, Don, we we talk a little bit through not just here's an example, but also how you read it, and we don't provide that guidance in the metric definition. We're just dropping in a picture and then we hope that someone um, who sees the picture connects the dots with everything else that we've said. So maybe the workaround here is if we do provide a picture like um, people leaving the open source community. I don't think we have a metric around leaving contributors, but new contributors. What does that chart show us and what can we learn from how it, you know, what, what are the things that we're looking for in the graph? I think that would help and justify also leaving that graphic in the definition. And it would be useful. Yeah, I would, I, I agree with that. And I, I think maybe if we get better at, you know, maybe we can, try to put captions under each of the each of the visualizations or some some text that goes with the visualization that just says you know this is this is how you might use this and this is where it came from I'm also okay with with removing visualizations that aren't just aren't meaningful like that count of contributors one that you showed earlier. I think we should just, I think we should just ditch those. But it might be, you know, so I, I don't want to hold up the metrics template work because of the visualizations. I would say that, you know, remove any that just don't make any sense. But maybe, maybe after we get the metrics in the new templates, maybe it would be a good idea to have somebody go through and scrub them and, and see if we can provide some better visualizations for each of the metrics. And Armstrong is adding comments in chat. Yeah, I do see that. Um, visuals are good to have, but need expl explanation. Yeah, I think that's spot on in agreement with what everyone's kind of thinking. And to your point earlier, Don, about um, they're in the guides and you get that from the metrics themselves. <laughs> like, so we were, that's kind of where we were like the flip flop of that we were like well they're in the guides so do we need them in the metrics like the guides is really what's 
like the nitty gritty of how to actually use these metrics. The metrics pages themselves are more just like informational, here you go. So that's, we were kind of thinking, well, if they're in the guides already, then maybe we don't need them in the metrics. But to your point, you're saying that's where you get them is from the metrics themselves. Yeah, and I think the metrics and the guides serve different audiences. So one doesn't replace the other. So having the visualization and the guides, um, like people who are really experienced with, with open source and using open source data might go to the metrics definition to better understand how we've defined something, but wouldn't they wouldn't necessarily go to the practitioner guides because those are geared, the guides are geared towards practitioners and newbies. The metrics themselves, I think, are a lot of, you know, people doing people doing research there. They have a really wide audience that the practitioner guides will never touch. And the practitioner guides will never cover every single metric either. That's valid. That's valid. So how, just like how we're doing the the effort around the references. So we're, we're kind of in agreement that maybe the same similar effort needs to be around the visualizations themselves, like somebody to just focus on that piece of it when it's all said and done. Okay, that's fair. That's fair. I'll just put that in here. Okay. Fair enough. What other comments do we have on this? Thoughts, questions, discussion? Okay, so for now, um, oh, go ahead, Augustine, did you have something to add? No, I'm sorry. Oh, no, you're fine. <laughs> you're fine. Okay, so I think with this pass, with this pass, we can we can easily remove any that don't make sense. That's totally fine. And then we'll leave the rest to to be fixed later. Awesome. Okay, so the next one on our list is the Hacktoberfest activities we do have a channel now that's called i'll write it in here Hacktoberfest. oops i can't spell today october fest i think 2024 something like that um because hacktoberfest was already taken but i couldn't find where i don't know how does slack work i don't know um anyway if you want to join in that's a great channel for all things hacktoberfest um, the tech writing team would love to have some more needs from other other teams in chaos for whatever they're looking for so that they can add them to their um, doc scavenger that they're doing which <clears throat> you can read more about here um, so they're trying to find different places to uh, that need help with documentation and provide some opportunities for people they are also doing a couple of virtual workshops like just an hour and a half on these two days. And then at the end of the month, they're doing a, a virtual Zoom party just to kind of close out the month, which is super cool. And yeah, so if you are on a team in Chaos that you know needs some help with some documentation or could use some help with documentation, please reach out to them, um, Harmony, or else pop in the tech writing channel or the Hacktoberfest channel and point them to some places that they can add to their list. There are also other um, other teams who are doing some Hacktoberfest work. So if any of those folks are on this call want to talk about it, now's your chance. Or we can um, just point everybody to Hacktoberfest channel and you can talk more about it there. Okay. We shall go on then. The next one on our list is data science. So I'm gonna let Dawn talk about this one. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you can click on that license changes and forks um, link. So within the data science working group and just me personally, we've been doing a lot of research into um, 
projects that have relicensed that have resulted in um, what we call hard forks or hostile forks. So this is um, people taking taking that relicensed uh, the code right before it was relicensed and turning it into a new a new project. So the uh, AWS did this with uh, to create Open Search out of Elasticsearch. Um, there was a group of people that did this for a project called uh, Redis, and they created a Linux Foundation project called Valky, similar Terraform, and a Linux Foundation fork called called Open Tofu. So these are the ones that we're looking at right now, and we have data about all of these. So there's uh, the notebooks folder has basic data looking at the organizational analysis, um, organizational affiliation data analysis that I've done for each of those. And, and I'm in the process of validating that with people who actually work on these projects. But what I wanted to bring it up, I wanted to bring it up here in this meeting for, for two reasons. Um, one is that, you know, we'd like for this to be a research project where lots of people can, can contribute. So um, Georg has already added uh, a section in, for some metrics that we, wa we might want to look at. There's a Google Doc, which has the basically the work in progress draft of the research report. So, um, so we need to do some analysis of metrics, which is more, more of a data activity. But there's loads of stuff that you can do, even if you're not necessarily into, into data science, if you have an interest in this topic. Because we need people to write things like the, the introduction section. There's a context section, which would be mostly kind of history and how we got to the place that we are now. And we have a whole bunch of helpful articles to help people write those sections. So you don't even need to be an expert in relicensing or, or forks. So I would encourage you to have a have a look at this. Um, the data science working group meeting is every other week in the hour before this meeting. So we have another one in two weeks. You're also welcome if, if this is something you're interested in and you wanna contribute, just reach out to, to me on Slack or in the data science working group channel. We'd be, we'd be happy to have other people participate. Um, so, so if you're interested, join us, um, it'll be fun. The other, the other thing I wanted to mention is we're, if you're not interested in contributing to the research but are interested in the topic, there's a video of the research that's been conducted so far. So um, it's it's actually an hour, the video is an hour and twenty minutes. Uh, James Governor talked before um, before me, so he works at Red Monk and he gave a really nice kind of overview of how we got to the situation that we're in now and some of the dynamics from a business side that have led us to these projects relicensing and the forks that have resulted from them. So that that was interesting. And then I spent 20 minutes and I just went over all of the research. So if you just want an overview of, of this topic, have a have a look at that video. I think it's a, a pretty good overview of what we've been what we've been thinking about. That's all I had. Uh, any questions about the, the research or the topic? I want to add that it's a super exciting topic because this license change is something that in conversations keeps coming up time and time again. And the impact that the license change has, I was super excited to see the, the blog post by Red Monk where they found, hey, there is no impact at least on the financials of the company which of course there are other factors that go into it and i'm super excited to see what's the impact on the community is there even an impact yeah absolutely and i think it'll be interesting to look at the different types of forks and the impact that they have because if you look at so Elastic Search really had no contributors from outside of Elastic. There were a small handful of people who made a small handful of contributions, but it was mostly Elastic employees. So the impact was really on the users in that case, which is why AWS took it and forked it and created Open Search because they needed something for their users um, to use that was that was open source open source. And they've since contributed it to the, the Linux Foundation. So it's no longer an AWS project. Um, and Terraform and OpenTofu is a similar thing. So HashiCorp um, employees contributed to Terraform. None of the people working on OpenTofu had ever contributed to Terraform. It was all brand new contributors. So again, the impact was more on the user side. Valky is, Valky is very different because there were 
uh, there were 18 people who contributed to um, uh, Redis that moved over to Balky. So there was the impact on the community was uh, was pretty was pretty big. So I'll be interested to see also some of the metrics and the data and looking at these different types of forks and, and what happened um, in these cases. So I do think it's gonna be really, really interesting research. So I encourage people to people to participate. And if you need any help participating or want some suggestions for where to start, just, just reach out and let me know. Uh, Don, I have some questions yeah. for you. How, uh, what scale of research are you conducting on, the, on this project? Um, is there any targeted venue that you have in mind? Uh, yes. So, um, so the, the scale of the research right now is limited to case studies of these, um, these six projects, these three, three sets of relicensed project and resulting, resulting fork. Um, so that's the, the scope of the, the research right now. The, the forum is that we would like to put together a research report that either gets published by Linux Foundation Research. So we're not targeting an academic, um, uh, academic uh, journal or academic forum for this. And that was a kind of a deliberate decision for a lot of reasons, because we want to get this out relatively quickly and you don't do that via, via the academic channels. Um, and we've also seen the Linux Foundation research gets a lot of traction. So if you look at the census that they did with Harvard, for example, that that's gotten quite a bit of attention. So we're hoping that we can push it out through the LF research channel. Um, if we can't, we'll probably just go ahead and publish it under the, the chaos project as our own research report. So this will be a, a research report that you know has some rigor behind it, but is not um, is not an academic article. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. That's good clarification. That's an excellent question because uh, it, yeah, it, it does influence how we how we put this research together for sure. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Don. Any other final questions for Don? <clears throat> or questions about how to get involved or what's needed? Okay. Uh, we just have well, I would like to participate, but my contribution can only come in like uh, giving feedback, like review. I'm quite busy right now, quite busy with a lot of academic uh, research work. But I can find time if the materials are there to give some pass and suggestions. Okay, that perfect. Would be yeah, that would be super helpful, Armstrong. So once once we get some sections written, I'll I'll ping you and have you. Uh, well, I'll probably bring it back to this meeting as well um, for feedback because, yeah, I would I would love to get your feedback on on some of this for sure. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Armstrong. <clears throat> so we have one more thing. Um, there's a half a thing that can come after this if we want to talk about it, but um, I just want to bring this to everyone's attention. It's that lovely time of year again when the chaos calendar is thrown into chaos yeah yeah it's it's a little bit wild so what we've tried to do this year is when i say we i mean me so if it fails i will take the full blame but in each entry of the in every meeting we have a field called this meeting follows daylight savings time for this time zone, which means that it's going to change with the US. So that being said, not everybody wants to check everything, but we try to keep it logical. So no, all the chaos. Like that, What's that? I would, I would go through it. I'm sorry, Yiga, did you I you cut off there. Okay, um, so for all the Africa meetings, we've kept them to West Africa time, which does not observe daylight savings. So there you have that. And then, of course, for the Chaos Asia meeting, wherever that is, somewhere. Um, I don't see it. Where is it? Here it is. 
shows up here late, but it's early the next day for them. That's on India Standard Time as well. So we're trying that at least that way. People kind of can know if they can expect a change on their calendar or not. We'll see how that goes. <laughs> I don't know. Um, we'll see. But just know that the next few weeks is interesting. So just watch the calendar. If you're not subscribed to them, you can always find this. This is the source of truth. It is. It does show up. It should show up, um, I think, in this central time by default. But you can change it to yours, I think, something like that. So, yeah, there you go. I'm curious just, on someone who is not in central, if you open the calendar, does it automatically show in your local time zone? Because I know the Google Calendar does. So it doesn't, um, but you can pick whichever. Because I'm in Eastern. Oh. So um, it you already know. Much. OK. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, that is one drawback that Google provided that was helpful, I think. So it will default to central, but yeah, you can change it right there to, to, to whatever you want. Um, any other questions on the calendar? We'll try to, you know, keep bringing it home and reminding everybody that it's that time of year. Okay. So the other thing I was going to mention, Anita, I don't know if we want to announce it yet, but we have been working on posting the code of conduct documents. We have one final PR to do, um, but then the documents will all be updated from the code of conduct team. Right now they're listed here. So we just need to make a quick change in the code of conduct to link to these two new files, but these have been published. So, um, yeah, you can find them on the website now. So we have the procedure for making code of conduct report and the code of conduct incident response plan. And I hope I'm not premature in saying that we have published these because we literally just published them five minutes before this meeting <laughs> happened, emerging in. And yeah, so does anyone from the code of conduct team want to say anything about these documents? This shouldn't be a surprise to anybody. They've been floating around the community for a quite long time, so they should not be surprised. But um, okay, thank you, Elizabeth. Yeah, so we just approved these um, documents or got approval for these documents. And in case you're struggling to or you have intentions of um, you know sharing the document with other persons that maybe in a situation that they need to make a report um these documents are the best places to refer to they give you like all the guides on how you can actually um start or approach any incidences that you experience within the chaos community um as you're contributing so you can always refer to these or reach out to the email provided if you need further assistance I think that's all that I have to say. That's awesome. I just want to also personally thank the members of the K um, Code of Conduct team for their work on these documents. They're really great. Um, I hope they help everyone just bring clarity. It brings clarity to our whole process. And yeah, it's just I know it's a lot of work that went into creating these documents and a lot of discussion. So thank you to the three of you, Georg, Anita, and Mary Blessing. Heart, heart to you all. Does anyone have any questions for Anita, Georg, or I don't think Mary Blessing's here today. <clears throat> I just have some few clarification. It might not really be the case, but why did you choose this word incidence response plan? Was it intentional or was it addressing a particular concept? Because it may have some uh, broader usage, which might go a little bit out of the, the context. I don't know if that was intentional. Um, I think we picked the word incident because 
it seemed like more um suiting for the context because it's actually addresses any um code of conduct violation incidences so like i don't think there was any pre-thoughts behind it though okay my concern was not because like in cyber security or in anything like still in the same uh, kind of space like the computer incidents response planning it's a quite different kind of document or a plan so might be uh, some clarification which also done at that level okay yeah. i mean people can use names the way they want to choose but it's just that some clarification in context clarification should really accompany it because if i'm preparing an incidence response planning let's say for a kind of vulnerability and a type of some kind of intrusion the this kind of document is expected i mean for code of conduct it's also a serious and grievous matter which i acknowledge and my, I mean, your explanation is good, but it's just that sometimes an ambiguity can creep in. Is there something to think about it? I'm not suggesting any modification or adjustment. Okay, thank you for pointing that. We'll discuss it during our next meeting and see if there's a way we could reward it to fix that. Any other questions, comments, anything for our code of conduct team? I will put this in here. Oops. Okay. We are at the end of the agenda. I will give one more chance for anybody who wants to speak up to add some stuff to the agenda before we give you your 14 minutes back today. Okay, let me stop sharing that. I have a little uh, one. Yay, I, I'm so happy, Sophia. I would be so disappointed if you didn't. <laughs> Well, it's not a real one. It's mostly to say thank you to you and Georg and Sean and Peculiar and all the others that showed up to the Grace Hopper open source day. I know I wasn't able to stick around, but um, sounds like we had some positive response on the Zoom and I just wanted to share nice job to all those who participated. Thank you. Yeah, for those who hadn't heard, we did a, a workshop with the Grace Hopper Open Source Day. It was a virtual workshop. Um, so we had the first half was um, just talking about chaos, talking about metrics, um, talking about non-PR kind of contributions and how we track those and how those are difficult. Um, Georg gave his squashing DEI bugs talk, which was awesome. and. Then in the afternoon, we had some breakout sessions for Gamore Lab and Augur. And it was a very long day, <laughs> very late night for folks in um, Europe and, and in Africa specifically. So um, thank you to those who stuck around. Um, yeah, we did get uh, quite a few new, quite a few, maybe six or so new folks to Slack. Uh, so if you see any of those folks, please welcome them. If they say hello in the newcomer channel, please welcome them. They were awesome. We had some good conversations and yeah, Georg um, asked, uh, asked some questions of folks, which I can't remember what they answered now because my brain is mush, but um, essentially it was, you know, what did you get out of the workshop? And it seemed like it was well received and people were learned a lot about metrics and kind of the pitfalls around them and uh, found them very interesting. Georg, do you want to add what else they answered? I don't quite remember. Hi. Uh... Overall, it was very positive. The caveat for to think about next year is all the effort that we put in, and then we had three, four, five people in in the session. So I don't know if it's worth the effort again next year. I think that's a good question. I did um, a little background research afterwards because I was surprised by the participation level, and I think. 
Grace Hopper responded pretty rigidly and appropriately, but didn't really share with us what was going on uh, to some really horrible things that happened in their face-to-face -face event last year. So a lot of the things that actually made it hard for us to be organized um, ahead of time and fill out all their forms kind of arose from some really just horrible behavior by, uh, frankly, bad dudes who were harassing people at Grace Hopper last year. So on the one hand, I agree. On the other hand, I'm, I'm hopeful that they find a less they find a more inclusive way, for lack of a better word, of having the event and encouraging people to attend, because I think the effects of all of the what I found to be kind of onerous identification processes in advance. Um, I'm it was a little discouraging for me personally, and I'm certain the same processes were required of the participants. And I suspect that depressed participation significantly. So I agree. I don't want to do it for three people again. That's a lot of work. Um, I also just want to, sorry, pay attention to the you know, things I learned and I wish they had just been more forthright with us that they were responding to something specific instead of just implementing all these processes that got in the way of people participating. That's my editorial comment. Thank you for digging into that a little bit and sharing what you found. Yeah, I can, I'll share, I could share a link with you. I don't want to share it broadly, but anybody that wants it, I can share it. That is all. Okay, well, um, that being said, let's go ahead and um, close this meeting for the Chaos Con committee. I think we were supposed to meet today. I don't know if I got it in me, quite honestly, <laughs> quite honestly. So um, I'm going to stop. I've been, 